All right, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. I hope you all enjoyed the Super Bowl uh, last week and had a little respite. And now you're ready to go back at it with us again. Um, Alex isn't here tonight. No, I'm not Alex. Uh, so we're not going to review the schedule and all the upcoming presenters, but you know how that works. And you know, if you go to the astroimagingchannel.org, you can see all the information about what's upcoming and what we're doing. Uh, so let's do a short introduction to Reg uh, Pratt, who's going to tell us about his uh, dual rig setup. And we had a short conversation before, and what was really interesting is that He's only been doing this for a couple of years at his astrophotography, and he's jumped right in to do this dual rig setup and actually told us that he had a quad rig setup a little bit before that. So he's gone from zero to uh, dual rig setup in, in, in seconds flat, which is, I think, a little unusual for people like us who spend years and years kind of going up from small telescopes to big rigs. Uh, so Reg is going to tell us about his experience, give us a little background of how he got to where he is. And Reg, if you're ready, you know, it's all yours. I'm ready. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Actually, if you ask us a question, Reg, it takes us a few seconds to unclick. On yeah. Mic. So we're still here. Um, hey, everyone. My name's Reg. Uh, I live in Vallejo, California. I've been in this hobby for just a little over two years. Uh, I started astrophotography in spring of 2020. Uh, I modeled my first telescope rig uh, almost part for part after uh, Trevor Jones' Z73. So that was my first telescope. It was a great scope. I had a lot of fun with it. But uh, living in a Bortle 7 sky, I learned pretty quickly that you got to image for a long time to make a halfway decent uh, picture. And I'm by nature very uh, impatient. So it didn't take long for me. I think the three or four months in, I started looking into getting a second telescope, and then that snowballed into a third and a fourth. Uh, at one point, I was running two tandem setups at once. Uh, I don't do that anymore because now I image at a dark site, but I still do uh, two telescopes at a time, whether it's the wide field setup we're going to look at tonight, or uh, I also have two eight-inch rich accretions. Basically, at all times, I'm using at least two telescopes. So I get a lot of questions on these. Um, I'm always posting. Uh, Instagram stories when I'm at my dark site and people are always messaging me, asking me questions. I've helped a few people get started with their tandem rigs, so I figured it'd be uh, a fun presentation. So a uh, little, little overview of what we're going to go over. Basically, I'll talk about equipment, uh, accessories. We'll talk about computers. I'll go pretty in-depth into acquisition software. Uh, I'll go over my workflow and I'll talk about how I keep my data organized. So uh, first of all, why would anyone want to invest the time and money into a tandem rig? Uh, simple answer is more data. You know, as astrophotographers, the goal is always more data. Uh, a lot of folks like me are probably doing their imaging from bright city sky, and we all know that the brighter the sky, the longer it takes, or rather the more data it takes for you to hit a good signal to noise ratio. Uh, oftentimes that can mean dozens of hours of data, which could take days, weeks, months even. I'm sure we've all come across a new target and got real excited to image it and only to become completely discouraged when we realize that that image is like 60, 70 hours worth of data. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Marcel Dresler, he's kind of my hero in this hobby. Uh, not only is he a part of a team that discovers so many cool deep sky objects, but his image processing skills, in my opinion, are second to none. Uh, however, those images are typically 60 to 100 hours with a very large aperture Newtonian in considerably dark sky. Uh, most of us, for most of us, that's a, a time commitment we're not really willing to make for one picture. 
So having multiple scopes working for you dramatically cuts down on that commitment, and it makes even the dimmest of objects uh, viable options. You're also able to make better use of short imaging windows, uh, whether that be brief periods of clear sky on a given night or having uh, very few clear nights in a year, people who live in, in very cloudy areas. Uh, I'm sure some of you can relate to going to bed on a cloudy night, waking up in the middle of the night to clear sky. Uh, that means, you know, maybe a two, three hour window to get some data. And for most of us, that's not really worth losing sleep over. But when you've got two scopes going, you can still come out of it at night with, you know, five, six hours of data, uh, depending on the time of year. And lastly, if you're like me and you're imaging in the field, having multiple scopes really helps make the effort worth it. Uh, my dark site is two hours away from my home. So every time I go out and image, we're looking at four hours round trip driving and I'm sleeping in the back of my truck. So I don't think that's something I'd be willing to do with a single telescope, but with two scopes going, I'm basically guaranteed to get 10 to 14 hours uh, data uh, every night in the winter. I've gotten as much as 20 hours in a single night. So it really makes putting out the effort to drive and camp worth it. Uh, before I go further, I just want to show an example. Uh, this is the Sol Nebula. We all know it. We all love it. Uh, this definitely isn't the greatest example of the Sol, but it's 26 hours of data. And I did this in just a night and a half, uh, two, two nights, not even full nights. I had some intermittent clouds. So this just kind of shows the kind of quality uh, you're able to get with small time commitments, even from bright city skies. Uh, this is the rig we'll be talking about tonight. This is the current incarnation of my tandem white field rig. Uh, I used to also have a tandem pair of Red Cat 51s, but I sold those a few weeks ago. So it's just this. Basically what we're looking at here on the left uh, we have two William Optics GT81s. They're 380 millimeter uh, triplet refractors, uh, 380 after reducers, that is. On the left, I have a ZWO ASI 2600 mono with a full set of LRGB and narrowband filters. On the right, a QHY 268M, uh, also with a full set of filters. Uh, they're both being focused with Prima Luce Sesto Senso 2 focusers. They're sitting on a bracket we'll talk about. Uh, we'll get into all that. And then the ZWO Mini Guide Scope. And everything's being guided by an IAPTRON GEM45 mount. Uh, when you're pairing telescopes together, uh, the goal really should be to match their field of view. Uh, field of view is going to be determined by the telescope's focal length and the size of your camera sensor. Uh, using two identical cameras and scopes would obviously be the easiest way to go about this, but it's not impossible to make it work with uh, mismatch equipment. For example, if one scope has a longer focal length, and therefore a narrower field of view, but a larger camera sensor, the other scope is shorter, but a smaller camera sensor, they can match up a bit. Here's an example. Uh, in the purple box, we have a Z71 refractor, which comes in at 1480 millimeters of focal length. And in the white, a GT81 with 478, which is its native focal length with no reducer. Both cameras have the same APS-C size sensor and their field of views are pretty close. You know, they're not perfect, but you could crop this outside without losing much data and make everything register fine. Here, we have a Sharp Star 61 with a full frame sensor and a Red Cat 51 with an APS-C sensor. And again, you know, even though the Sharp Star is a little longer in focal length, the sensor being bigger makes the field of views match up pretty decently. You know, you wouldn't have trouble cropping this for most large wide field images. You know, you're not really missing much. Now we have two of the same telescope both GT81s. However, in the blue box, we've got a full frame sensor, while in the purple box, a much smaller micro four thirds sensor. Now we're gonna have some problems. Uh, if you're using color cameras on both telescopes, it's not as big of a deal. You know, as long as your integration software is good at blending data sets together, you can get away with this. Uh, but if you're using mono cameras, it becomes much more of a thing. 
because if you're using two different filters here, uh, say you're using HA in the purple, O3 on the outside, you're going to have to crop all of this because you're not going to have any HA data here. Or alternatively, you'll have to switch the filters around, gather more data uh, so that you have data to cover both field of views, or you'll have to buy two sets of filters and maintain you know, two full sets of filters for each scopes, which is what I do, but it's definitely not you know, the most cost-effective approach. So whatever combination of telescope and camera you do choose, uh, you want to make sure you get both scopes running independently first before you put them in a pair. That means things like focuser settings, backlash, filter offsets, you know, drivers, all that stuff. It's got to be working fully first. I think we all know how big of a headache chasing mount gremlins can be. Uh, imagine doing that with two telescopes at once. I've tried it. It's not fun. For mounts, uh, these tandem rigs can get heavy pretty fast, depending on what you're putting on it. Uh, the GT setup here weighs 38 pounds in its current incarnation, and these are not large telescopes. Uh, if you're planning to use like small refractors or DSLR lenses, you can get away with a much smaller mount. Uh, the Tandem Red Cat rig I told you about that I no longer have, uh, I had on an HEQ5, and it was great. So smaller equipment, not very demanding. But if you're going to be on something like a 4-inch refractor, you're definitely going to want a solid mid-class mount like an EQ6, you know, a CGX, a CEM40, something in that range. Any larger, and you're going to be looking at mounts with at least 60 pounds of payload capacity. Because like I said, this stuff gets heavy fast. If I were to take these GTs that I use off and put on like a pair of 130 millimeter refractors, uh, the total payload goes up to 50, 55 pounds easy. And then you're looking at large ioptrons, you know, the CEM70s, 120s, EQ8s, CGXL, stuff of that matter. For the bracket, uh, these come in different sizes. Uh, this one's from ADM. It's 15 inches end to end. And uh, the big thing about when you're choosing a bracket, not only do you want it to be strong enough to hold your telescopes, but you want to be mindful of the clearance. Because as you can see here, uh, when I first put this rig together, I had a different focus motor that was much shorter. But with the Sesto Senso, there's not much space here between the, uh, the focuser body and the saddle knob. And yeah, I could turn the scope upside down and make the focuser face outwards, but then balance gets weird. So it's just something to keep in mind. You're not just sizing the bracket for the weight of the scope, but also for the width of any accessories you might have on it. And uh, one thing to keep in mind, this bracket does weigh eight pounds. So, you know, that's not an insignificant amount of weight to be putting on your mount. Depending on the mount you use, you may need a 90 degree deck adapter because to mount the tandem bracket, you have to turn your deck 90 degrees first. And if your uh, deck has hard stops, you're going to hit those hard stops when you try to slew south. So this 90 degree adapter just slides into the saddle, locks in, and then it gives you uh, a horizontal saddle for you to put your bracket in. Uh, this adapter is going to add another five pounds, something to keep in mind. And then if you want your scopes to have a common center, which is not always the case, uh, this is an optional item, but if you want your telescopes to have a common center, you're going to need some kind of a way to aim them, whether it be an aiming device, or I've seen people uh, drill into saddles and stuff so that they can move the scope around. Uh, that's way beyond my ability, so I'd stick with, with pre-done. This is the ADM Max Guider, it's the biggest aiming device they make. It can handle about 14 pounds of telescope, and it comes in at another eight pounds. So if we take the weight of the, the dual bracket, the saddle adapter, and the max guider, that's 21 pounds of payload before you put anything on top of it. So it's really important to be aware of your mount's capabilities and you know proceed with caution, use your best judgment, and don't overload your mount. Well, when it comes to computers, whatever computer you're currently using will work uh, for a tandem setup, unless it's an ASI Air, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. 
none of the acquisition software I've used to date has been very power hungry. So you don't need a lot of power if all you're going to do on that machine is data acquisition. Obviously, if you want to do a little pre and post processing, you might want something stronger. But for just acquisition, even something like a mini PC, it's just fine. Uh, this is actually what I use. Uh, what I like about the fanless mini PCs is that they're fairly inexpensive. They're extremely flexible on software and they're small. So taking them out into the field, bringing them back in the house to offload the data is, uh, you know, very convenient. And they also only sip about 15 watts of power each compared to uh, the Intel Nook that I used to use, which was like 65 watts. So just crazy power. So anyone who images in the field or away from AC power can appreciate, you know, a computer that that is as low power as possible. It also, the one I pick, uh, has an Ethernet jack on it, which I feel like is a big deal because especially when you're running multiple telescopes, you know, most nights I'm coming out of the night with upwards of 40 to 50 gigs of data. And anyone who's transferred a couple of gigs, a, a couple gigs of data on Wi-Fi knows how long that takes. So having Ethernet on the mini PC or whatever PC you use is a, a big plus because it makes that data transfer go from a couple hours to like five, 10 minutes. It is a headless unit though. so. Uh, I use a, a cheap mini PC or mini router that I got from Amazon. Uh, it plugs into the Ethernet of the mini PC. It puts out a Wi-Fi network, and then I use that Wi-Fi network to connect to it through either my tablet or my laptop, and that's how I control everything. You'll likely need some kind of a power and USB hub. Uh, this setup uses seven USB ports, five DC power ports, and three do heater ports. Uh, for that, I use the Pegasus PowerBox Ultimate. It gives me enough USB and 12 volt ports to get everything powered and plugged in. And a cool plus of it is all of these ports are manageable in software individually. So you can power cycle devices, turn on and off USB ports if something's malfunctioning all from your computer and you don't have to physically be at the mount unplugging things in the dark. Uh, the UPB also automatically manages my dew heaters, so they only run when they need to. It has a, has a temperature and a hygrometer on it, so it monitors the dew point, and it'll only kick them on with, when it's necessary and only at the lowest power necessary. So that's pretty cool. Uh, all of these, you know, my two cameras, cooling, dew heaters running, mount tracking, uses about three to four amps of power at 12 volts at any given time. So I have everything running on a 100 amp hour uh, lithium phosphate battery. Uh, they are significantly more expensive than lead acid batteries, but they're also significantly lighter. This one weighs in at only 20 pounds. So again, as a mobile imager, things like that matter a great deal to me. And they also don't have to be kept above 50% capacity like a lead acid battery does. So, you know, any any decent uh, lithium battery will have some sort of a battery management system in it that'll keep it from draining too low. So it's not something you have to monitor yourself. Uh, Reg, could you hold it for a second, uh, yep. Molly? Yeah, um, uh, somebody was trying. Uh, somebody was trying to enter the call, and I didn't get to it quick enough. Um, I noticed okay, the big so screen just a second ago. <laughs> we're back up on YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Reg. All good. Should I continue? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So yeah, um, the cool thing about lithium batteries, even though they're more expensive, they're much lighter. You can drain them as far down as they will go. Uh, with my setup and a, a 100 amp hour battery, I can expect around 25 hours of power. So there's no chance even with uh, coolers running and dew heaters running at max that I'm gonna lose power mid-session, uh, even during the longest winter nights. One thing to keep in mind though, that these large capacity batteries do take many hours to charge if you do run them down completely. Uh, I actually keep two of these and I cycle between them so that, you know, like I said, my dark site's two hours away. And uh, by the time I get home in the morning, plug the battery in, leave for work, come home from work, and then have to drive back up, 
sometimes the battery's not fully charged. So by having two of them, I know that I always have a fresh battery ready to go. And uh, it's, you know, keeps the stress down. For software, um, there's some features you want to keep an eye out when you're choosing the software, if you're going to run a multi-scope rig. Uh, the software either needs to be able to control multiple cameras in a single instance or to control multiple instances or run multiple instances, rather. Uh, it needs to be able to synchronize dithering between the two cameras. Uh, this is the, the important part, and that's why I said earlier, no ASI errors. Uh, nothing against the air, but if you don't synchronize your dithering, the cameras are going to lose sync very fast in the, in the, at the start of the session. And you can look forward to losing one third, if not more, of the subs from your secondary camera from it taking subs during dithers. Uh, I've actually, I actually ran my setup without dithering for a couple weeks. And, you know, in my opinion, if you're going to put in the effort to set up a tandem rig, there's no point. Uh, leaving data on the table that you don't have to because you can't dither sync. Uh, not to mention, if you were going to use the ASI Air, you would need one per telescope, and one mini PC costs significantly less money than two ASI Airs. You also want to keep driver support in mind. Uh, you know, you might be trying to use duplicate pieces of equipment on the same PC, and uh, in that event, you're going to need to be able to select them based on their COM port in your imaging software. Uh, if the drivers don't support this, then you'll have to use different brands of stuff. But that's that's one thing to keep in mind because I remember when I bought my first set of uh, robotic rotators, they're Pegasus Astro rotators. Uh, I got two of them for my two mounts, plugged them in, got real excited to go. And then I see that you can't do two of them you know it picks up whichever one it wants to pick up and it doesn't the other they eventually put out new software that brought that but something you want to keep in mind especially if you already have a setup that you're trying to duplicate uh, make sure everything you have can uh, be selectable by comport uh, in my time in this hobby i have used astro uh, astro photography tool nina and voyager uh, they all work. They all work well. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, if I'm honest, I would place ATP at the bottom of the list for anyone who does more than simple sequencing. Uh, Nina and Voyager have clear advantages in that regard. Their advanced sequences are so good and, and so powerful. Uh, the coolest thing about Voyager to me is that you can network PCs together. Uh, I've done this because, like I said earlier, when I'm not doing a tandem rig, I'm running two mounts side by side. So each mount has its own PC. So even with the GTs being on one mount, I would keep the PC on each scope. And they're both connected to the travel router. And from Voyager's perspective, it picks it up and it treats everything like it's on one computer. But the upside is you don't have to deal with the annoying COM port issue. Because even though they're linked together, you know, all the devices are connected through their respective computer. Uh, in the end, though, I stayed with Nina because I love the way its sequencer works. And I love how customizable uh, the user interface is. Uh, two quick notes about Nina, though, before we get in. Number one is I am using the version 2 beta, uh, nightly number 40. I'm not sure what it's up to right now. I haven't updated it, but it's still in beta status. Uh, version 1.10, which was the last official version, does also have dither sync, but it's pretty buggy. And it doesn't give you access to the advanced sequencer or the library of new plugins that Nina has. So even though version two is still in beta, it's extremely stable. I've been using it for over a year now, back when it was still version 1.11, and it's solid. It doesn't crash. It does everything it's supposed to do. I'm not quite sure why it's still in beta. It makes me wonder what those guys have uh, in the pipeline, but it's a very good software. So anyone thinking about trying Nina, but afraid to try beta software, don't try it. It, it works really good. It's very stable. Uh, number two, uh, in order to access the synchronized dither command in Nina's advanced sequencer, 
you're going to need to go into the plugins tab and download the plugin called synchronization. Once you download it and restart Nina, you'll then see the synchronized dither command along with the list of all the other triggers that it offers. And three, it's not a must, but I use Nina and Stellarium together. And if you want to use a planetarium with Nina, you're going to have to set that up. Uh, it's not something you have to do, but it is a part of my workflow, and I will be showing that uh, later on. Uh, Reg, can I ask you a question before yes. you move on? Go for so it. You have to sync dither and you have to sync focus and, no. and the timing of your your exposures, right? Wait, ask, what was that? Say that again, please. So you have to sync dithering and focus and then, of course, exposures. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Okay, thanks. Um, so here is an example of what a typical sequence in Nina looks like for me. Uh, like I'm not going to go super deep into Nina because that would be a whole video in itself. But this is basically what a sequence looks like. So here on the left, this is the quote unquote main sequence. It's the left scope. Uh, Reg, this is, yes. Reg, one more thing. Uh, the type is kind of small in there. It's really hard to read on YouTube. If oh, you no. can bring up your magnifier, and if you want to show any of the text so we could read it, you probably need to. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that. You're on a Windows machine? Yeah. Uh, just type in magnifier. You got it. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, well. Um, yeah, you can, uh, as you move your mouse around. Um, oh, is it just magnifying where my mouse is? Uh, yeah. So so wherever your mouse is, wherever you're kind of pointing is, it'll move the magnification with it. Um, and then you can escape back out of it when you're ready to move on. Okay, uh, I'm not. It's like spanning across both my screens, so I'm not even sure what you guys are seeing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a little bit, a little bit problematic with uh, double screen. So we're looking at the uh, uh, the begin sequence box is in the middle right now. Okay, so the left sequence here is the main sequence. Uh, it's what controls the bulk of the session. So we have the target information here, which in this case is the Orion Nebula. It handles everything like the meridian flip, uh, autofocus, restore guiding, like the major functions, plate solving, slewing, all that good stuff. And then if we jump down into the first element of the sequence box, uh, this is the beginning of the sequence. So it's going to unpark the mount. It's going to switch to my luminance filter. It's going to wait for dark. And then it'll slew and center the target. It'll start guiding. And then it'll start taking exposures. So you can see here, it's set to take five minute exposures in hydrogen alpha. It's set to dither every three exposures and it's gonna keep looping this instruction until either nautical dawn or the target sets below 30 degrees of altitude. Conversely, I see how this works. Conversely, on the secondary scope, its job is just to take exposures, autofocus, and wait for dithers. And it's also just going to loop this until nautical dawn. Let me try to get out of here. Reg, good time for some questions. Go for it. Uh, Sophie Taylor asked... Um, uh, since photon collection is proportional to the square of aperture diameter, why not a single larger scope rather than two smaller ones? So I guess her question is, uh, why not use a bigger aperture as opposed to uh, two single scopes in which there was some discussion of, well, essentially what, you know, that poses the question you could use two bigger aperture telescopes. <laughs> I, I yeah. Think the, well, yes. The thought is that uh, you can use a big aperture telescope and take twice as many with half the exposure time, or two smaller aperture scopes with longer exposure time and twice as many that way. Yeah, yeah but so, the problem is going to be is that the focal length of the big aperture is going to be yeah. That's that's what I brought up. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, pretty much. You know, a, a large aperture scope is going to give you higher resolution and it, it'll pull in more light. But, you know, f field of view is is a factor. So if, if you're going for wide field, uh, I know Plane Wave is coming out with a really big wide scope, but I can't think of many very large aperture scopes that are also uh, wide field that don't cost as much of a, as a car. So, yeah, you, you can as long as you're okay with the field of view that it provides. Awesome. Thanks. She had one more question. That's a great question, Sophie. Um, ever considered, she wants to know if you've ever considered using tandem optical radio. Mm, no, I have not. Okay. That's all the questions for now. Thanks, Reg. Yep. So where were we? Yeah. The sequence. So moving forward. And I realize now that, None of you can probably see any of this, but this is just an example of, of what a live session actually looks like. So I keep my Nina instances color coded by the telescope so they're easier to uh, distinguish so you don't accidentally do something on the wrong mount. So in this case, this was the last time I used uh, the tandem red cat setup. So on the left is actually a space cat, which is, if anyone knows the space cat, it's gray. So this instance is gray. And then the red cat is this instance here. And the only the only real takeaway is here that of note is that, you know, they're both set to autofocus every 90 minutes. They're both taking 30 second sub exposures. However, I have the space cat set to do about 30 minutes of RGB per channel and then switch to luminance while the red cat is just doing luminance through the entire night. And they're both set to dither every six subs. And there's actually, I know you can't see it, but there's actually a dither. Let me pull the magnifier back. There's actually a dither taking place here. So you can see uh, this, this the sync server, which is the dither server, uh, dither in progress. This instance is the leader. Uh, with Nina, when it comes to dither sync, the first instance that you open up will automatically be the leader. Uh, but it doesn't really matter which, in most cases anyway, it doesn't really matter which instance leads the dither because they're both going to dither at the same time anyway. Uh, but you can see from PhD2, it's actually settling the dither. And then over on the second scope, you see it's waiting for the leader to dither. So when this uh, settling, when the dither settle is finished, this instance will tell the other that we can continue taking exposures and they will continue taking exposures until it's time for the next dither. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my typical workflow. Uh, after polar alignment, I'll run autofocus on both scopes just to get them ready. And then I use Stellarium and choose a bright star. It doesn't really matter what star you use as long as it's one that you can distinguish from the rest of the field, especially when you have a lot of stars in field. So I usually use like a main constellation star. I always tend to pick something that's as low on the horizon as possible because uh, the Max Guider. Uh, for at least my copy of the Max Guider seems to uh, work best. The knob seems to work best when the scopes are as horizontal as possible. I know one time I tried to adjust it while it was pointing at like 70 degrees uh, altitude, and it was really hard to work with. I, mean, I had to pull some tools out, and I've, I've heard from other people too that they had to get tools out to get some of the knobs turned sometimes. So as low as you can uh, makes it a little bit easier. So I, I pick a star in Stellarium, and then I, because I have Stellarium and Nina linked together, I'll come into the main instance of Nina and come to the framing tab and then click this button here that's get coordinates from planetarium. It'll populate the RA and deck of the star that I chose. And then I can click slew and center here and it will do exactly that. Uh, now you have the star uh, centered here in the main scope. Next, I set both instances to loop one second exposures. So it's kind of like a live view. Uh, I would go faster if I could, but uh, 26 me megapixel camera, even if I'd been for 
still takes a while for the pictures to download. So one second exposures are fine. And all you would do in, in your instance here in the imaging control window is make sure you have a loop clicked when you take the exposure and then they just both keep going. Next, I will turn on the crosshairs, the crosshair overlay, which is this third button here. And it'll give you a crosshair overlay on the preview screen. And I just center up the second scope until the star is centered on both. Uh, rotation at this point isn't really important beyond what direction the star moves when you turn a knob. So if depending on your camera rotation, you might turn the left knob, but the uh, star could go up. So if that throws you off, you can take the time to rotate the camera properly, orient it properly. But I usually just take note of the directions and just proceed. It, it usually only takes a minute to get these centered up because most times, because I have my dovetail marked, uh, the aim of the right scope is usually not too far different from the left. Um, after the two stars are centered, uh, actually, let me go back. So this is if you want both scopes to have a common center. Uh, let's say, alternatively, you're imaging a large area sky and you want to do a mosaic. Well, after you have a common star centered, you could then turn the secondary scope out to the right or to the left, depending on which side your aiming device is on. Uh, make sure they have a little overlap, and then you can do a one-by-one -one panel, which is pretty cool. I've never actually done that, but it's a good option to have. You know, you could do like a four-panel mosaic in two nights, depending on what it is, instead of shooting one panel, at a, one panel per night. Uh, Nina's Framing Wizard also does give settings for mosaics, uh, kind of like SGP. So if you know... Uh, if you know the overlap between the two scopes already, you can put all that into the framing assistant and it'll give you the correct center coordinates for the right, for the left scope so that everything frames up the way it should. And then my last step is I will slew to my target. And at that point, I will set my camera rotation. Uh, Nina does have a full on framing wizard and it's a really good tool but it runs as a part of the sequence. So if you put it in the sequence and then it gets to that step, it'll only it'll only set it only get you to set your rotation on the main sequence. It won't pause for the left sequence. So I end up doing it kind of the manual way. And basically what I do is I'll take a single exposure, like a one, two second exposure. I will plate solve it with this button here, which is the plate solve current image button and it'll give me the center coordinates and the rotation angle uh, of the camera. So I'll check the rotation angle, rotate the camera myself, either manually or if, if, if you have robotic rotators, this whole thing happens automatically. But if you're rotating manually, like most people, so you basically just rotate the camera, take a picture, plate solve it, rotate, picture, plate solve. And so you've got this one right. And then you come over and you do the exact same thing on the right telescope. So now you're pointed at your target, your mount is tracking, and your rotation angles are matched. I don't spend a ton of time trying to match the rotations perfectly. You know, as long as they're within one degree of each other, you're fine. And likewise, I don't spend a ton of time trying to center these two stars perfectly. Uh, you could zoom in 600% and try to get them identical to the last pixel, but that doesn't really ever seem like uh, a good use of time as long as they're relatively close. You know, you're going to have to do a little outside cropping anyway to account for dither artifacts. So it's really up to you how close you want these to be. But within a degree of rotation is good and, you know, reasonably centered is good. And at this point, I will start the main sequence. It's going to go through, you know, unparking the mount, even though it's already unparked. It's going to go through all the steps. It will already be on the target, so it's not going to have to re-aim because it's already on the target. Uh, if your polar alignment isn't great and a little bit of time went by before you actually started it, it might 
do one or two plate solves to recenter the target. Uh, and then it's going to start guiding. And if you have a force recalibrate, you know, to recalibrate guiding and start guiding, guiding will settle. And then the main instance will start its first sub. Uh, it's at that point I start the second the second instance and uh, it's off to the races. And usually I wait for, you know, the first few subs to roll in and then I go to bed. And that's 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 the basic workflow. So, Reg. Yes. So that means you have to start each sequence of Nina. Yes. Going, and then yeah. after that, they synchronize their dither, their focus, whatever. Yeah. So the the a cool thing about Nina is with the advanced sequencer, you can basically set Nina to run on a schedule. So one of the first commands in the pre-session uh, part was to wait for uh, nocturnal dusk before it does it actually let me go back and hit it with the magnifier so right here this command tells it to wait for nocturnal dusk uh, you can put a specific time in here uh, you, you can do nocturnal you could do astronomical uh, night if you want but you basically tell nina don't do anything until this time but there's no way currently to synchronize this. I was I actually spoke with some of the Nina developers on their Discord about it not too long ago. And currently, there's no plan to make a way to synchronize uh, the wait command between two instances. So you have to just start them manually. But once they're started, they will sync up. So because I'm waiting to, for the first one to start, and I start the second one, so they're a little, they're a few seconds off from one another but they come back into sync after every dither. So even if say the second instance ended up being like 20 seconds ahead of the first sequence somehow, it's gonna finish its exposure and then it'll just wait for the, cause it knows that dither is supposed to happen. So it'll wait for the other instance to finish and then they'll do their dither and they'll be back in sync. And uh, likewise with autofocus, uh, in practice, the autofocus, so where is that? Let's go up, up, up. So you see here, it's set to autofocus every 60 minutes here, every 60 minutes here. This timer starts when you start the sequence. So because there's, you know, a, maybe a few minutes between starting two sequences, the auto timer focus will be uh, a little bit off, but I've never had any issues with that. They, it's close enough. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. So this is just a, an overview of the workflow I just went over. Uh, another thing you're going to need to do when you're making your sequences. Now, I make my sequences at home uh, in the comfort of my office so that I'm not, you know, having to have my gloves off and, and typing out at my dark site. But one thing you're going to need to do when you're making your sequence is decide how do you want to scheme your filters if you're doing mono. So, for example, when I do an LRGB image, I have the main scope take between 30 minutes and one hour per RGB channel and then switch to luminance for the duration of the session. Meanwhile, the second scope is doing luminance the entire night. And then, you know, I'm always doing at least three nights. Uh, I have, like, for, for my own... For my own sensibility, I believe in minimum integration standards. So for me, that means I will always have at least 30 minutes of RGB. I will always have at least 10 hours of luminance. And if I'm doing narrow band, I will always have at least 10 hours per filter. And I, then I'll go from there based on how you know dim the target is or what, what the needs are. So like an example session would be night one for an LRGB, I'll do luminance and RGB. And if I have enough RGB, I'll do double luminance the second night. If not, I'll do another round of RGB and luminance. But to be honest, I don't think I've come across a target yet that needed more than about an hour uh, per RGB channel. You know, the luminance is doing the heavy lifting. Uh, likewise, if I was gonna do like an HA RGB, night one, I'd do luminance 
uh, one scope. The second scope would be RGB into luminance. Night two, assuming I have enough color, it'll be luminance and hydrogen. And if I'm doing narrow band, you know, just, just like with broadband, luminance does the heavy lifting. With narrow band, HA generally does the heavy lifting. So I'll do HA03 night one, HA S2 night two, and go from there just as as the needs of the image goes. You know, we all know that every image is different. So you can't really apply a static technique to, to every image you do. Got to change it up a little bit. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, I'm pulling in gigs and gigs of data every session. And uh, in this section, I'm going to talk about how I keep all that data organized. Uh, anyone who's run uh, multi-scopes in any form can tell you that the amount of data you pull in can get very overwhelming very fast if you don't have good organization. Uh, at one point in 2020, I think I mentioned earlier, I was running two tandem setups, so four scopes total. And I actually was somehow blessed with 18 clear nights in a row, uh, September of 2020. I don't know how that happened, but it, I learned real fast that, you know, it's awesome getting all this data, but it became downright stressful trying to keep track of it all. And it almost got to the point, you know, towards the tail end of that, where I didn't want to go into a session to grab more data because I already had so much data on my hard drive to deal with, you know, the data, the calibration frames, it can be a nightmare if you don't have a good system. So this is the system I came up with to keep track of uh, not only my open projects, but upcoming projects. It's basically just a Google Sheet, and then you can't see it here, but I have four uh, tabs. So the, the one sheet has four tabs to keep everything organized by season. Uh, and then in each box here, so each box is a target, and I have the name of the target or, or just the, des the designation. I'll have an example picture of it just so I can easily tell what I'm look which box I'm looking at without having to read it. Uh, I'll have the telescopes, the cameras, and the filters, the sessions. And then here, I just use the uh, sum command to make the spreadsheet keep track of my totals. So every session, when I get home and get the data in, all I have to do is get the totals, enter them here, and then the spreadsheet will keep track of my totals per filter and the total for the entire uh, project. So that's very useful for, for keeping track of, of what you've done and what you need to do. Uh, this example also kind of reinforces my idea of how beneficial a tandem setup can be because this project here said 51, uh, which is the second to last. It's actually what I was imaging in those screenshots uh, I was showing a minute ago. You know, this 32 hours of data is three nights. And, you know, Orion was already close to, uh, this was a few weeks ago, Orion was just nearing the meridian. So, you know, these sessions were only like five hours, you know, almost six hours. And even with that short, because if you take dithering into account, that six hours is going to be like four and a half if you're lucky. But I was still able to get 32 hours of data in those three nights. So it made all that driving, camping, and freezing worth it. In terms of the data itself, this is the file and folder structure I use. So it's really important that you have this stuff set up in your acquisition software. It, help, it will help you keep things organized. So I have it set. We have the main target folder. And then we have, in my case, two subfolders, which would be the name of the cameras. So the 2600 here, the QHY here. And then the next subfolders will be the frame types. So what kind of, what kind of data is it? Uh, and then of course, in the lights, everything is organized by filter. So it's really easy to come in here and find exactly what you're looking for. You know, if I need to know, did I take flats for the 2600? I don't have to dig through a bunch of random folders to get the answer. It gets, it, you, you get to it uh, immediately. And then this is the naming scheme I use for my subs. So every sub starts with the camera it was taken with, the name of the target, uh, there should be an underscore here. I don't know why there's not here, but usually there is. Uh, the type of frame. So in this case, it was a light frame. The filter, the sequence number, which starts at zero, and then it just counts sequentially 
through the session, which is very uh, convenient. If you use something like Blink to go through your subs and see what you're going to delete, you can easily identify a bad sub by the sequence number instead of trying to do it from like the date and the time. So you got the sequence number, the binning, the game, the offset, the sub exposure time, uh, the camera, what the camera was called to, and then date and time. And uh, that's about it. Uh, you know, putting these tandem rigs together, it's not terribly hard. But when I put my first one together, there was barely any information. There was zero information on YouTube about it. So uh, my hope was that this information could be a one-stop shop for anyone thinking to do the same. Uh, if anyone has any questions about tandem rigs, feel free to reach out to me. You know, I could talk Astro all day. And I hope someone found this interesting. Reg, I saw on your last slide, you didn't have any dark folders, but you had bias folders. And So I maintain a dark library. Uh, this folder, this main folder here is what's on my imaging PC at the end of a session. So I transfer all of this to my main computer in my office. And on that computer, I have a dark library with master darks waiting. But you you do biases for these? Yeah, I knew someone yeah. was going to notice that. Yeah, I, I do bias. Um, I know it's commonly said that CMOS cameras don't work with bias frames, but I've had four 1600s, which were not supposedly notorious for not liking bias. I've had three color 294s i've had four mono 294s and now i have three imx 571 chips and every single one of them has worked flawlessly with bias frames uh just as an experiment when i moved from the 294 to the 2600 and the qhy and i also have the altair 26 which is the same uh chip i said all right i'll, I'll start doing dark flats so i started doing dark flats and uh, they were working but all of a sudden, for some reason, I couldn't track down. They stopped calibrating right, and my lights were overcorrecting. Uh, Restack the data with my master bias. That works fine. So I think it comes down to the individual sensor more than the type. Like, I'm sure there's some people out there with 2600s, and theirs don't like bias frames. But, you know, I've had a lot of cameras, and they've all worked with bias frames. So I think you got to just try it and see what works for you. Can I ask you, without going into detail, what kind of processing software you use? I use PixInsight mostly, and uh, I use Photoshop a little bit, mostly just to refine my masks. But it's it's 99% PixInsight, and then I do all my stacking in Astro Pixel Processor. Rory, I think a couple questions came up. Yeah, Sophie asks, given how close the scopes are, do they always experience identical seeing? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I haven't, I've never noticed a large discrepancy in the, the half flux diameter of the stars between the two scopes and what little change there may be I always put down to, you know, having different cameras and different filters. But no, I, I would say no, they're, they're basically the same. And then John Adastro would like to know about your balancing routine. I think you went over that earlier. I did not. So I balance it the same way I would balance a single telescope. So I get everything on there. I get all the cables on, everything plugged in, uh, turn it sideways and balance the RA. And then uh, I will bring it back upright. I know some people balance the deck with the RA still at 90 degrees, but you can't do that with a rig that weighs 38 pounds. So I'll repark it with the RA balanced. And then I just unlock the deck and adjust it until uh, it doesn't move. It's not perfect. I, I wouldn't say it's perfect balance. You know, the scopes are lopsided. I know oftentimes when people in an effort to balance, uh, you know, they'll use like counterweights or something. So the scopes are not centered on the mount, but if you free the clutches, nothing will move. So it's, you know, it's not even, but it is balanced.
Thanks. I think that's all the questions for now. There was one more about the exposure for bias on a CMOS camera, and I commented that it's as quick as possible. Um, I believe that's the right answer. And yeah, this. so for for the Z for pretty much all ZWO cameras that I'm familiar with, the uh, so bias frames are supposed to be the fastest possible exposure, and for at least most ZWO cameras, that is 0 0.032 seconds. But with Nina. If you set the exposure to zero, it's going to automatically take the fastest exposure the camera can take. And do you use bin one or bin two? I use both. So when I'm on my eight inch Richie Cretions, I use bin two. When I'm on my 10 inch Newtonian, I use bin two. When I'm in wide field, I use bin one. And what kind of scene do you normally get? Uh, my dark site, well, in the summer, uh, it's usually around two, two and a half uh, arc seconds. It's it's pretty decent. It's not stellar, but it, it's pretty decent. It fluctuates between two and four. Uh, at the beginning of fall, uh, I, so I, I when I started going to my dark site in uh, last summer, last June, I didn't have a single windy night, and the seeing was great, and the place was great. Come fall, almost every day is seeing, you know, 15 to 25 mile an hour winds. And now the seeing is, you know, four, four to five. But I'm, I'm not a perfectionist. Like I, I do my best to make, you know, the best image I can make. But I'm not someone who's going to forego imaging because of bad seeing. The only, the only thing that's going to make me not image is clouds or rain. So. I'd rather have an image with, you know, slightly larger stars than no data. Did you put up your Astro Bin site? I'm sure some of the yep. people on. I am why on Astro you... Bin. Yeah, why don't you just put it up so we can see your page? Uh, I have it on my screen now. Can you not see it? Oh, you mean the yeah. actual Astro Bin? Yeah. So, okay. yeah the, his, the website's there, yeah. I mean, there if you want to see my pictures, I can scroll through my gallery real quick. So just put up your Astro Bin site and people know where to. It was already there. Oh. So my Astrobin username is reg underscore zero zero. Uh, I don't have all my images there. Most of, uh, pr if you want to see all my images, they're on my website or on my Instagram. But these are the ones I thought were worthy of Astrobin. And at least for two of them, someone agreed with me. Rory, did we get all the questions? Yeah, that was all the questions. All right, uh, let me turn on my camera. Uh, you can end your presentation, Reg. Well, that was interesting. I think you know, I learned a few things uh, just watching about sequencing with dual rigs. Uh, I've never done it, but I know that question has come up a lot of times when I've thought about putting on a second rig. Yeah, I mean, you know, none of this is rocket science compared to using a single scope. The biggest thing is just picking the right software because, like I said, if you're trying to use like a pair of ASI Airs or, you know, SGP or something that doesn't synchronize dither, you really do lose a lot of your data. I mean, you still come out of the night with more data than you would, than what you would with a single scope, but it, it really stinks having to throw away like a 30 or subs every night. No, I, I think if you don't synchronize it, then it really is hardly worth doing it for all the bother you go through. And by the way, I do tell everyone it is rocket science. <laughs> um, yeah. And then if, if you want to go into like a worst case scenario, uh, that short time I was running unsynchronized, I did have a session where uh, the secondary scope tried to run autofocus during a dither and it failed. And it ended up taking that scope out of the sequence completely for the rest of the night. So uh, there are reasons why you want to synchronize your dither, and especially because Nina's free. And uh, the new version, the new sequencer, and all these new plugins are so good. It's uh, it blows my mind that this is free software. I'm actually pretty impressed with. Uh, I mean, when I was first looking at alternatives to Secret Generator Pro, people said that Nina probably wouldn't have all the advanced features that I would miss from Secret Generator Pro, but it looks like 
is largely caught up, if not surpassed. I'm looking for, I'm, I'm actually looking at switching to something else because the autofocusing algorithm in Sika Shermator Pro uh, needs needs work. <laughs> it's uh, it's not great. <laughs> yeah, so I've never used, I know a lot of people that have used SGP. I never used it. You know, I started with ATP and honestly, I only even left ATP because at the time they didn't have autofocus and I was tired of losing half a night's data to uh, lost focus. But I can't think of anything someone would want to do that the new Nina sequencer can't do. Uh, if you want to keep score, Voyager probably has the best sequencer on the planet. Uh, that software was made to run uh, unattended. It was really made for people who have remote observatories and they want to just click a button and let their stuff go for months at a time. So I found the UI to not be ideal, at least for my tastes, but that's because, it, you know, it's made to run on its own. But it, its sequencer is insane. It, it can do some stuff Nina can't do, but also those are things that only pertains to, like, the top half percent of astrophotographers. So yeah, I thought about. I was looking at Voyager. I got the trial version, um, but I didn't get to fully try it out before that lapsed. So now I got to make a decision. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 definitely not, in my opinion, a software. So Nina, you can figure out. And if anything, you know there are a lot of really good and detailed tutorials for Nina on YouTube. On Voyager. Not so much. There is some information out there, but it's not nearly as detailed. And when you log into it, because the user interface was made to like, not really be one, it's not a software you intuitively know how to set up. It, it, it took me like a month just to get Voyager configured in a way that I could start like testing it by taking actual data. Nina, on the other hand, you turn it on and like, there's the equipment tab, there's the framing tab, there's the sequence tab. Like it's very self-explanatory and you can figure it out on your own. Reg, before you go too much further, you have two Voyager users in the room. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, Voyager is great. I, I'm not trying yeah. to paint a picture like it's not good. It's probably the best, you know, as far as capability, it's, it's probably the best software there is, but I didn't find it to be the most user friendly, but I also understand that if if it's made to be running automated, you know, the developer's not gonna put emphasis on the UI. So definitely nothing against Voyager, but Nina's simplicity and the fact that it's made to be, you know, used by a person and not running completely automated, even though you can pretty much completely automate it, uh, it's my choice. You know, I, I see you have a guide scope, so I assume you really never have an issue with finding a guide star. No, never. And especially when you're, so my dark side is magnitude 21.3 at the zenith. So even when I'm at, you know, 1600 millimeters, it, there's, I've never not found a guide star. Well, everyone, I think we've, we've covered everything and Reg, thank you so much. Uh, you had a Thanks nice audience, me. and it's been very interesting for all of us. Uh, no yeah, matter how experienced we think we are, there's always something to be learned. And now I'm thinking about coming up with a dual rig. Not well, sure. I will warn you, uh, once you start dual rigging, whether it's on one mount or multiple mounts, there's no going back. So uh, unless you're willing to you know, hop to a, a much larger and more expensive scope, uh, I actually did that. You know, I was telling you how uh, my dark site has gotten real windy lately. And 99% of my imaging was actually done with, uh, and I can actually show you guys if you want to see uh, a, a dual Richie Cretion setup on two mounts. But well, those... sure, go ahead if you got a, if you got a slide present. It's not even a slide, it's just my website. Let's see. Okay. Entire screen. Sure. So equipment. So these are my various setups. Um, I have to remove the red cat because those are gone. But this here is actually what I'm using 99% of the time. Uh, there are two eight inch rich accretions uh, reduced to around 1200 millimeters a piece. 
but you can see they're spaced out pretty far and these things do not hold up to wind at all so it wasn't a problem for the first you know five months of me being at this site but come fall i i couldn't image at all so i ended up having to uh put together a sky box which works great but the size of it only accommodates one mount so my last couple sessions i was only using the single rc and it was painful only coming out of the night with four and a half hours of data when you're used to double digits every night. So uh, be warned, if you start tandem imaging at all or dual imaging at all, there's no going back. And the next time you see a nice shiny telescope that you want to buy, you're going to have to buy two of them. Well, I assume you spaced out the two RCs so you could get a stereo view. Not really. Uh, they're not even as spaced as it looks in this picture. They're mostly just far enough apart that the mount cases fit between them so that when they're uh, when they're tracking, they don't hit each other. I think he's teasing I'm you, sorry, Reg. That wasn't a serious question. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to say. <laughs> I, 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 I did a, quite enough there with a couple of feet. <laughs> I did see a thing on that. I, I did watch a, 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 a video on that not too long ago, actually, and it was a thought of mine, but it's too much work. Yeah. There's enough space at my dark site where I could get a good amount of distance between the scopes if I wanted to. Okay, I think you can stop presenting. Is is there anything else, Molly, Rory? I think that's about nope. it. I well, if we're all done, thanks everyone for uh, attending the session. I, Reg, thanks again. You can uh, stay with us for a little bit when we sign off. And yep. uh, Molly, why don't you take us out? All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.